Good afternoon, happy new year and welcome. And thank you for joining us for our webinar on the new IRS WISP requirements. WISP standing for Written Information Security Plan. Am I right about that, Christine? Yes, sir. Right, I am Gary Dehart. I'm the publisher of Tax Practice News and Insightful Accountant and the host of today's uh, pretty short 30 minutes or so uh, webinar. Before I introduce our speaker, or really, yeah, before I introduce our speaker, I have a favor to ask. So if you're familiar with our two products, we have Tax Practice News, and then we also have Insightful Accountant. Insightful Accountant, we cover um, primarily, but not exclusively, but we cover have a lot of coverage on QuickBooks. So we have a webinar series similar to this one for that audience that's called QB Talks. We need to uh, name this series for TPN and, and Christine and I before we were uh, both being highly creative and we have tax <laughs> talks that, uh, that, that is on consideration, but or TPN tax talks. But if you have an idea, throw it into the chat. We'd love to, to have you know, a list of things to choose from. Um, so, and then and if we choose yours, then you have the bragging rights of, hey, they chose mine. Uh, so again, you can just put that in the QA or in the chat. Uh, so here we go. So with, uh, without further delay, so Christine, like I said, is our speaker, Christine Gervais. Christine is a licensed CPA using her skills to help businesses grow and achieve the fullest potential. Christine has a master's degree in accounting, has held her CPA license for over a decade, and is a nationally recognized speaker, providing education to other CPAs on how to best serve clients, as well as instruction on a wide variety of topics for business owners on how to maximize success. She's also the owner and co-founder of Epiphany Consulting Group Incorporated, which provides outsourced services and education to other CPA firms. So a couple of housekeeping items before I turn this over. As I said, this is a short webinar, about 30 minutes or so. So we do not have CPE available for this session. But if you do have any questions, we ask you to put them into the questions panel. Christine will monitor that and try to get to uh, all those and answer all those questions that she can. And we will be putting a link to um, the recording. Well, sorry, a re the copy of the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel. I will put that link into the chat. Then I will also put a copy of the presentation in the chat. Do I have a copy of the presentation? Did you send me that? Yes, I did. But okay, I, yeah, yep, as soon as we're one. done, we can get okay. that in the chat as well, too. Yep. Yep. So we'll put that in the chat. Then also, as a follow up, within 24 hours, you will receive an email that has a link to our YouTube channel, which is where the recording will be. Then also a link to our box um, account where the uh, slide deck, the PDF of the slide deck will reside as well. You can just download from there. So without uh, any further delay, Christine, thank you so much. And uh, I am going to go dark. It's all yours. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Let me just get this slideshow started for us. Okay, great. And we'll get Zoom up over here. Let's see. We can share the screen. Give me one minute. And we will get our slides up here. Awesome. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm also going to get the Q&A box up going so that if you do have any questions, please feel free to try just pop them in that Q&A box. I will keep an eye on it, as Gary mentioned, as we go through. Um, very exciting topic today. Guidance coming out from the IRS and talking about these written information security plans. Exciting stuff. Uh, it's always fun and exciting when the IRS issues new guidance for us. Um, and what we're going to be going through today is what does all of this mean for those of us as practitioners? What are the things that we need to be paying attention to? Um, what are the rules surrounding this? Where do we need to be to be looking, et cetera? So as Gary mentioned, the WISP stands for Written Information Security Plan. So the requirement to have these plans came out of the 2022 IRS Security Summit. So this is actually something that came out about August, September of last year. Uh, the two publications that you can see on the screen right now, publication 4557 and 5708 is what issues the guidance to us related to these plans. So feel free to go take a look at those. I'm sure that I have many of you on the line today that 
are very technical in your research and you want to go to the original source. So those are the IRS publications that will give you the original source information as to what are these, what it's required, etc. Um, I will tell you as we go through, I'll do my best to answer any questions that you have, but this guidance, and you can go read it after the presentation, it's not super black and white yet, of course, because that's just kind of how we do things. Um, but I will do my best to get you all of the answers. If I'm being a little vague in my responses, it's possible that it's just that we don't have the actual black and white answer yet. But we'll get the ball rolling on what it is that you need to know today. So the baseline of this is that this guidance requires all tax preparers with a PTIN. So your P10 gives you the right to electronically file tax returns, file tax returns on behalf of your, your taxpayers, your clients. Anybody with a P10 number is going to be required to have a written information security plan. Therefore, you're bound by these guidelines now. So this includes enrolled agents. This is not just for CPAs, and that's important as well. So just anybody with a B10 required to have this written information security plan. Now, as far as I can tell, um, I'm assuming this question will come up. If you have multiple P10 holders within your firm, you could all be uh, covered by the one firm WISP that you have in place. So we'll just get into some more uh, details as to what exactly this compliance requires. Now, according to the guidance, we were all required to have these written plans in place by the end of 2022. However, uh, there's no specific guidance yet as to how this will be enforced, how the IRS is going to check who has a plan and who doesn't have a plan, um, and what, if any, consequences would arise were they to determine that you don't have a written information security plan in place. So not super helpful for us to get an understanding of, you know, where should this be in our priority order, but suffice it to say that if you have no written information security plan in place, and we'll talk about like what actually goes into these written information security plans, like what are some of the things that you actually need to address. Um, start working on it ASAP. So this is not something that you want to shuffle under the rug because the expectation was that these were done as of the end of last year. And it's probably safe to assume that if there was a, like an insurance claim because of a cybersecurity issue um, or, you know, if some other type of problem should arise, it's most likely going to be asked for you to provide a copy of the plan that you had in place and, and probably some other documentation as well, uh, which you'll start to gain an understanding of as we kind of go through the details of what these plans require. So again, if it's not in place yet, there's no you there was no requirement for you to submit it per se. Um, but we obviously want to make sure that you're getting something in place as quickly as possible. So just to give you some quick places to start, and again, if don't worry about you know grabbing these right now, if you don't have a chance to, we will make sure that this slide deck is sent out and you have these links available to you. But if you want to copy them or scan those QR codes with your phone, uh, both of these templates will get pulled up for you. So we did provide a couple of different options for a free template as to what needs to go into your WISP document. So the IRS issued their own free template as part of that 5708 publication. So you can follow that link and that will take you to the IRS template that again, they're offering for free. Tech for Accountants also did a really great job of developing a really beautiful checklist that allows you to kind of go down through all of the different areas, categories, um, types of things that you need to be thinking about and looking at within your organization and really check off, do we have this? Do we not have this? Do we sort of have this? And that checklist does a really great job of starting to give you an idea of what information uh, are we probably good with and where are maybe some of our holes that we need to do a better job of addressing. These will also give you the structure of, of what parts 
of the plan do you need to start working on writing down? So just one more second to grab both of those. And again, if you don't have the opportunity to grab these links right now, we will make sure that the presentation gets sent out and you have both of these available to you. So to start giving you an idea of what these documents require, and again, this is all meant to be written. So I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a few minutes, but kind of some typical areas of non-compliance. And this is just things that I've come up with in my experience of working with other, especially small practices, uh, things that you might not necessarily think about that you are required to address as part of these WISP documents. So most of us will have things like antivirus software and, and firewalls. That's pretty standard now. Most of us work off of our computers and we know that we don't wanna have tax returns, social security numbers and things like that, um, that will be potentially at risk without some type of antivirus software and firewalls. Um, but those softwares may not be up to snuff in terms of what they're required to provide to you. So some of these kind of like over the counter, just, you know, got it at Staples antivirus softwares or the, the typical ones that just come preloaded onto your computer. That software might not be robust enough to actually keep you compliant for these purposes. So just kind of think about it from the perspective of like, you probably need a little bit more security than maybe like the average high school age kid using their laptop to do their homework and play some games. And so you want to make sure that you have an understanding of, you know, what software are we using to keep our computers and all of our electronic information protected? And is that robust enough to really meet these cybersecurity requirements? The password enforcement policies. So these ones are very, very specific coming right out of the guidance that we've been provided and important to take a look at that you have to require passwords to be more than eight characters. They must be regularly changed. And if you are using a password keeper, the password to the password keeper must be extremely difficult. And that software that you've chosen as a password keeper cannot have had a historical breach in their own information. So there is an area of probably some research, probably some conversations with your IT company. Um, and I know that we were going to do a couple of polling questions. I'm curious to see the feedback, how many uh, practices are potentially working with an I with like an outsourced IT company right now. So I would love to hear your feedback. Do you currently contract with an outside IT firm? And I'll give you just a minute to go ahead and pick yes or no on that one. We're not going to publish your answers, so don't be afraid to say no. If you're not, that's okay. I just would really love to see the feedback of how many of you are working with an IT team. Give everybody about 10 more seconds. Pop your answer in there. This will also help me kind of give you some guidance at the end of the presentation in terms of where you're at. Okay. Okay. So that's probably the split that I was expecting. About 40% of you said you are, about 60% of you said that you're not. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for that. So <clears throat> some of this stuff that we're going to talk about is really probably not the highest and best use of your time. Or if you're like me, I might be fantastic at preparing a tax return, but when it comes to my technical knowledge, the best way that I know how to fix my computer is to like hold down my power button and, and restart it. So it's very possible that you're going to need to seek out a good IT firm. And I'll give you some tips for that towards the end to help you with some of these. You do have the ability to uh, set up some automatic and electronically enforced regulations around passwords so that you're forcing your team to regularly change them, forcing them to require that eight characters, things like that. And then an IT team might also be able to help recommend to you 
a password keeper that has not had a breach. I personally am a big fan of one password. If you're not, if you haven't tried that one, I think that one's a great piece of software uh, that you can go take a look at. So other requirements that may or may not be things that you're doing right now, the uh, WISC document is required that you document how you are regularly checking both your hardware and your software inventory. So that means that you would have to have your hardware and your software inventory written down. I think a lot of the, a lot of us probably do this with our hardware, you know, especially where we've moved into so much more of a remote environment. A lot of firms are tracking who has what laptop and where, but maybe not doing an inventory of our software and kind of continuously checking up on those, making sure that the softwares that we're using are not presenting any type of issues, problems, data breaches, et cetera. So it does require that. Um, Great question. I use Practice Protect. What do I think of this? Um, it's like last pass on steroids. I actually have not used Practice Protect, so I, I can't personally comment. But again, I really think that finding an IT team that you can trust, and again, towards the end, I will give you some tips on finding a great IT team that you can trust. Um, and asking them to do like a little mini audit of what you are currently using for both hardware and software and to kind of dig a little bit into the softwares that you're using to see whether or not there's been any issues of data breaches, et cetera, um, is a great way to help you get some answers on some of these. The other kind of just little uh, random thing that I'll tell you is a lot of times free software so let's i'll just take dropbox for example because i know that that is um kind of commonly used the free version of dropbox typically does not provide any type of insurances to you as the user if there's a data breach to your dropbox whereas a paid version the fine print does include uh, some level of insurances on, you know, from Dropbox to you as the user if you're using the paid version. So reading the fine print on some of these cloud-based softwares can also be helpful so that you have an understanding of uh, what type of protection is afforded to you as a user of that software and what type of protection is not that you might need to have an ancillary uh, layer of security for. Um, so you have to be disabling automatic password memory on basically your team's entire um, you know, list of computers. So that one, again, you need help with making sure that those settings are already on laptops and desktops and things that your team is using before they get them. They can't just be using automatic password memory, like going out to Google and saving all those passwords. Passwords saved have to be kept in a secure password keeper. And then you also have to have a written schedule for tune-ups. So you have to have it written down what your policy is for doing regular tune-ups, checking everybody's laptops, checking everybody's desktops, making sure that there's actually no issues. So this is, these are just some examples of some of the requirements of the plan. Um, and just keep in mind that not only are you required to actually actively be doing these, you're required to actually keep a written document that details out how your firm is continuing to follow these compliance requirements. So what is your regular hardware software inventory check? What's the cadence of that? How often are you doing it? What are the procedures for doing it? Um, what is your regular tune-up schedule? How often are you doing it? What are your procedures for doing it? So all of those things have to be written down just like any other internal control document that you'd be creating for like an audit client, for example. Okay. So I did just kind of start to touch on some of this. How is all of this implemented? So obviously it does need to be written. So not only 
are you having that sort of twofold layer of addressing all of this where you have to figure out what do we have in place versus what do we not have in place? And so you need to address where your holes are to anything that you don't have in place. How are you going to get it into place? And then this all needs to be written down essentially as a procedures guide so that anybody in the firm could pick up this written information security plan and understand exactly what the processes and procedures are for each of these different areas so that everybody understands what their their personal expectations of conduct are when it comes to protecting information uh, that the firm has. So training needs to occur and be documented. So again, another layer for you here is that it's not good enough for you to just develop the written plan and then put that beautifully written plan on a nice bookshelf and let it collect dust. You actually have to have regular training and you have to document that regular training. So kind of very similar to our CPE, where everybody in the practice has to have documentation that they've participated in ongoing written information security plan training. Now, again, where we see the guidance kind of being a little bit vague right now, and hopefully we'll get some clarity in the future, because of course this is all brand new, is it doesn't document a specific cadence. So we have no specific guideline, and of course we're accountants, so we love things to be black and white and not gray. We don't have any specific guidance right now as to how often that training needs to occur. Um, but suffice it to say that since many of us are just at the tip of the iceberg of actually putting these written information security plans in place, once your document is written, you should roll it out to your team and document that initial training of having it at the very least be rolled out and that you've gone over this training with everybody in the practice and that they're signing off that they've received that training, they've received a copy of the document, they know where to find it should they have any questions in the future which speaks to that next point that the plan needs to be available and accessible to all. So you have to have this in some type of a shared resource place once it is written so that everybody in the practice has consistent access to it all of the time. So again, if there were to be any questions or you know, hopefully not, but if there were to be an issue, you can, you can easily show, hey, we not only trained everybody on this, but it was accessible to them at all times. And so if they were not sure about how to conduct themselves or they did have a question, this document would have addressed that for them and they did have access to it. And then part of that written plan also needs to address what are your procedures if a data breach does happen. So what is somebody going to do if all of a sudden they find that they've accidentally clicked on a link in an email that you know was suspicious or they think might have um, opened a virus onto their computer? What is somebody going to do if their laptop got stolen out of their car? All of those types of data breaches need to be addressed. What are you gonna do if a client calls and says that their social security number has been stolen and they're not sure, but they think it might've been tracked back to you know, their, their tax return in your office? Who knows? In any case, it needs to be part of this written plan that what do you do if you are aware of or you think that there may have been a data breach? What are the next steps? So that needs to be written down as well. This again can be really helpful to have an IT team help walk you through this um, or just have them on a contracted basis because part of addressing that data breach very well may be that you need the assistance of someone to help you come in and figure out how to stop that data breach and how to correct any potential issues, especially if there was like a virus on a computer, et cetera. Also, you need to include a disaster relief plan. And so this one, I think we forget about sometimes, although uh, for those of us here in the Northeast, we're expecting very heavy snow and power outages tomorrow. So what happens in the event that there's a disaster in the office? You know, if you keep paper in the office and all of a sudden the office is flooded and those papers are floating away or a computer was destroyed or you can't get access to uh, the laptops that are in the office because something happened and we want to make sure that those are protected. Any number of things, um, but the there needs to be a written piece of this plan that includes what do you do in the event of a disaster.
is there an opportunity to shut down access to maybe electronic information that is at an office that physically can't be reached? And then how do you get that information up and going and securely accessible at another location? So I'll pause for just a second to see if there's any specific questions on things that I've discussed so far. And then I have some next steps and some action items for all of you to kind of help you, guide you in the direction of um, where do I go from here? I, I personally, and I think that a lot of small practitioners especially feel this way with these written information security plans is that they feel very overwhelming to us, especially if there's only a couple of people in your practice. Um, but we want to make sure that we're arming you with the information that you need to get these into place so that, of course, you're, you're compliant with everything. Um, will the PowerPoint be made available? Yes, of course it will. So I think Gary had mentioned that within 24 hours, we will send out the link to the recording of the webinar as well as the attachment to the PowerPoint slides. And he also includes the link to our tax practice news box folder, which has um, the PowerPoint for this presentation as well as old ones in there as well. So yes, you will actually absolutely get a copy of the slides. Um, great question, George, how will the IRS check for these plans? We don't know yet. So that's not completely clear from the guidance. Again, I am not 100% sure if they're moving in the direction of actually requiring P10 holders to submit these plans, or I think probably more likely than not right now, unfortunately, um, what would happen is if you did in fact incur a data breach and did not have this written plan in place, that there would probably be some issues with that, whether they be um, you know, a consequence from the IRS, I don't know, or whether or not that would just be an issue with the insurance company. We don't have an answer to what exactly the consequence of, of not having it is yet. Um, any guess as to the time required to go from zero to compliance? Yeah, Terry, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, they haven't they haven't issued that guidance either. As I mentioned, if you read the IRS publications, the requirement to have these in place was as of the end of 2022. So, absent some sort of written document document as of today, we're not in compliance. So, I do highly encourage you to start working on something, even it, even if it's not an absolute perfect document, to have something in place that addresses that, which is why I think the checklist that we gave the links to is a, is a really great place to start, because those checklists um, you can start going through and will actually identify for you the areas where maybe you have nothing in place. And so those are probably gonna be your, your best priority to start working on sooner rather than later. Good questions. Um, okay, so just some next steps for you. Um, ooh, one more question. What do I recommend for smaller businesses that don't have multiple computers and only one employee? Yeah, so you'll have to go through the checklist because it just, it, it might be that some of the items on the checklist don't particularly pertain to your practice because of size. Uh, but the IRS did not limit this requirement based off of size of the practice. So unfortunately, even for smaller practices with only one or two employees, maybe only a handful of computers, these requirements are all the same. So you do still have to go through and have a written document. You still have to go through and make sure that you have documented training even with your one employee. So I, again, I think just start with the, downloading those checklists and start going through and figuring out what does in fact apply to you. Maybe there are some areas where they're not applicable, but that will help give you some guidance as to exactly, like I said, where your holes might be, where you maybe don't have anything in place at all right now. And I would focus on those to start. So next steps for you, download that checklist to start reviewing the requirements. Um, start addressing your areas of non-compliance. So again, those areas where maybe you have absolutely nothing in place, write and disseminate and schedule training on your existing procedures. So at the very least, um, if you do have things in place, I think that the best step, to twofold, right? 
priorities, if you do have some of these existing procedures in place, I would make sure that you get those written down as quickly as possible, because then you can at least disseminate that and schedule training on your existing procedures. Any places where you have holes would be your next step of that process to start addressing those holes, getting those written down, and then you can schedule more training. So that will give you some priorities to kind of focus on. Contact your insurance company. So this is also a really great place to start is to understand what, if anything, do you have that is in place currently for cybersecurity insurance? So a lot of uh, CPA firms now contract to have cyber and cybersecurity insurance. From what I've read on these checklists, uh, your insurance doesn't necessarily address a lot of these steps, but it might help be part of the equation for you. So ask your insurance company what you have for coverage. You might wanna also ask them what they have in place for their own types of checklists, guidance or documents that might be able to help you put this together or lead you in the right direction. Um, if you use the AICPA's liability insurance, they do also offer cybersecurity insurance. And I know that they offer a lot of free tools and resources to help you to assess your firm and how secure you really are. And here's my best tip for you in terms of interviewing IT professionals. Ask your IT professional, anybody that you're looking to potentially hire, if they have experience, if it's not with a CPA firm, ask them if they have experience with HIPAA compliance. So any IT firm or IT contractor that has worked in a HIPAA uh, environment and is aware of what the security requirements are for um, a HIPAA compliant organization, like a doctor's office, for example, they're going to have a very good understanding of what types of information security systems you need to have in place. Because of course, the information that we have, names, addresses, social security numbers, all of that falls under what we would consider to be personally protected information. So somebody with that level of experience, again, is going to have really good answers for you in terms of what's the best password keeper, what's the best firewall, what's the best security system, how do you set up these, these automatic requirements for passwords, and, and they'll just be able to be better guides for you. I really do recommend that you do find an IT professional that can kind of be on call for you because you're absolutely going to have questions and things that come up as part of putting this plan into place. Um, another question. Uh, yes, this is a recorded webinar. So everybody who did attend it, attend will get a copy of both the recorded webinar and a copy of the slides. And also, you can always go out to our tax practice news YouTube channel and see recordings of the old webinars. So if you missed the first part of this, just go check out the Tax Practice News YouTube channel. Go ahead and skip, hit subscribe while you're there, and that way you'll get notified when we have new webinars that are up for you. So I think we are definitely at time. I'll just leave it open for one more minute to see if there's any follow-up questions or things that I can address for you. My contact information is up on the screen. So if there's something that you think about later that I might be able to help you with, please feel free. Nothing like a good old fashioned WISP requirement right at the beginning of tax season. Woo, just makes you want to get up and go to work, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, this is definitely, I think, a stressful one for a lot of people, because as I mentioned, they're, they really didn't limit it in terms of size. So this is a, a big lift for a lot of small practices. But those checklists that we um, provided the links to, and again, when you get the copy of the presentation slides, those links will be right in there for you. Um, that tech for accountants one is is really great. It's very robust and it does a really nice job of kind of organizing the different steps that you need to take. Um, yes, Jake, there is a recording. So the recording of this will get sent out to you within the next 24 hours. And if you ever don't receive it in your email, again, you can just go to the Tax Practice News YouTube channel and all the recordings are there for you as well. Yeah, and I have put the uh, presentation in the chat, so everyone should be able to see that. And I also put the link to the YouTube page in the chat as well, so you should be able to see that 
So, all right, thank you, Christine. Thank you again for, uh, for taking some time sharing uh, some information on what I won't call a very exciting topic, but <laughs> a but a mandatory topic, a, right? a necessary I mean, one nonetheless. Yeah, they I mean, can't, they can't you know, all be exciting, unfortunately. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, death and taxes, right? And yes. uh, now it's death, taxes, and your wisp. And your wisp. Um, yep. That's right. So now you have to add that to that. Anytime you say that, uh, make sure you add and your wisp. Got to have it. So, well, thank you again. Have a great, uh, well, it's almost the weekend. So, have a great weekend and we will see you very soon. Thank, thank you all. You all.